Amen. So we're going to talk a little bit about Jesus. And uh, the, I don't know if you guys read the adult PFS, but Pastor Dean was talking about how just, just how huge, inexhaustible Jesus is, right? It's like all throughout all eternity, we're just going to be just discovering new things and just celebrating uh, who he is and what he's done. And that's, that's kind of the balance that I would like to strike tonight, because I know people who know a whole lot about Jesus, but they, they, they have religion in their life. They judge people. They know a whole lot of scriptures, more scriptures and more addresses than I know, but there is an ungodly, there are ungodly characteristics about their life, right? So we want to know who Jesus is, you know, and, and I like it. I like the cute little story, just to think a little, little baby Jesus in the manger. That's adorable. And just, the, just God blessed the day that he came to this earth and was born of the virgin named Mary. That's exciting, right? But we can't just play cute church and know the story of Jesus and not have about our life this, this reflection of who Jesus was, right? Like remember when the, when the term uh, was first Christians was first used, uh, it, it was that they were calling them Christians. They're saying they're Christ-like, Right? That's where it came from. That's the origination. So, so we want to know what he has done, right? Who he is, like the finished work of Jesus. We talk a lot about the finished work of Jesus, what that means for us, right? Now, how we should live our life based on the fact that some certain, certain things have already transpired because of Jesus and what he's done, what he's accomplished. But also, what we must now do. Right? There has to be activity. There has to be this balance between Jesus, who he is, what he's accomplished, all those things, us, who we are now in Christ Jesus, and what we must now do. Right? We don't want to just talk about how great Jesus is and not have action, activity in our life. Honestly, like, I've been doing some reading in my Bible, and I look at the things that Jesus said. I'm like, man, that's a tall order. Love those who hate you. I'm not there. Those who despitefully use you and abuse you. I mean, I'm, I'm just mad at people who aren't even good at running our country. They haven't even done it directly to me, and I'm, like, mad at them. I'm like, get them, God. I'm looking for vengeance scriptures. <laughs> Anybody with me? Get them. Strike them down, Lord. I don't like globalism. I don't like communism. I don't like none of it. But Jesus talked a lot about walking in love, forgiving people. And I'm like, man, I got so far to go. But what I love about the Word is when you read the Word, you see things that you need to change the word never brings condemnation. You never feel like trash about yourself. You, you feel compelled, like, I need to do better. But with that compulsion, it's like there's an excitement, like, I know I can do it, right? It's not oppressive. It's not like, God, I suck. Man, I suck at every, you know. I need to stop saying that. That's kind of crass. <laughs> Sorry. I said, like, man, I'm terrible. Man, I'm trash, right? There's no oppression with it. It's like, you know what? How I've been living is not good enough. I need to make a change. That's what the word does. It's never, it never has an overwhelming feeling associated with it. If you feel overwhelmed, if you feel like trash, it's always the enemy. Always the enemy. You need to know, you know what? Enemy's trying to work in my thoughts right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray in the Holy Ghost right now. I'm going to put on a worship song right now. I'm going to get into my word right now because the enemy's trying, to, enemy's trying to trash my mind. Yeah, that's good. I need to renew my mind with the word. Right? Anytime there's feelings of oppression, feelings of depression, you need to know that the enemy is at work. And honestly, all y'all deal with that. Everybody. I mean, and you guys, you guys are college and career age. You're a little bit further along. Like, I look at sometimes the, you know, the 9 through 12 graders, and it's like, man, they're probably fighting right now. Like, like is there even going to be an economy when I get out of, uh, uh, you know what I mean? Right? But we teach them faith. Listen, it, 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 and as long as the earth remains, there's going to be seed time and harvest, right? The Bible even says even, even when the, the, they're making people take the mark of the beast, there's going to be buying and selling. People are going to be given in marriage. So it's going to get crazy, but it's still going to be just like what we know today. We're still going to have to walk by faith. So let's get in some uh, scripture tonight. What do we have to have to be scriptural? Scriptures. Amen. So we're going to get into some scriptures. I do want to tell you guys. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jesus in the month of December. We're going to be talking about Jesus next week. Jonathan's going to be here the 16th. He's actually going to be here, which is Wednesday. So we're not going to be having late night that night because we're going to be in there having revival. And uh, 
He's going to be here 13th through the 18th. So that's Sunday morning at 930, Sunday night at 630, Monday night at 630, Tuesday. So I want you guys, all y'all, all y'all to be here every single night. Your life is going to be changed. I promise you. We're living in the last days. We're going to get set on fire. We're going to burn for Jesus uh, and, and just charge hell with a water pistol. And we're going to, we're, we're literally, we're literally going out on top. We're going out victorious. Now, there's going to be believers who would be hiding behind a dumpster just like, come get me, Jesus. And there's going to be others out there winning the lost, walking by faith, walking in peace, walking in joy, walking in supernatural provision. And that's us. But it doesn't just happen automatically. We qualify for it. We prepare for it just like an athlete would prepare for, for a game. Right? When the game comes, it's too late to prepare. So we need to be preparing now. So I want to encourage you guys, be here the 13th through the 18th and then the 19th. Did, they, did we show them the thing already? <laughs> Y'all, look at Choose Life Church doing big things in the last days. What? Do y'all don't know, do y'all know Danny Gokey? Okay, they know him. What show was he on? What show was he on, American Idol? Did any of y'all see Danny Gokey on American Idol? All the leaders said, hey, we saw him. Thank you, leaders. <laughs> That's so crazy, man. How old are you guys? I'm 21. You guys are like, what, 20, 19, 18? I know. There was something else the other day, and it was just like, my God. <sighs> so awesome. Life just gets better and better, y'all. It does. It don't matter. Uh, age ain't nothing but a number. Here we go. Matthew. Um, so we're going to believe God for a greater understanding of the significance of Jesus. We have a book in our bookstore called In Him. It talks about who we are in Christ Jesus. And it is just like, we're everything. We are, we're, the, we're the best. We're, we're fully capable. We're fully equipped. Uh, and so just believe God for a better understanding of who you are in Christ. But tonight we're going to talk a little bit about... Um, kind of the life of Jesus, seeing the, some of the things that he said and some of the ways that he lived. Because for me, I don't know about you, but I kind of like to see the big picture and just like kind of have a general overview and just like, okay, let's dig in. I don't really like to like just kind of dig in and just like find my way and then at the end be like, oh wait, okay, I think, I'm, I, think I got it now. Like I like to look at the full complete puzzle and say, okay, this is where we're going. So um, that's kind of what we're going to do tonight. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. I got quite a few scriptures here tonight. But, uh, you know, some of them you may just want to jot down the reference. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We like to, t to say that like we're not literally dragging a cross around town. We're taking up our purpose. Why was I created? Why am I on this planet? Because every single one of us were created with significance upon, like literally supernatural divine significance upon our life. You have to keep uh, reaffirming that to where it becomes very real on the inside of you. Every, really? God is not winging it. He's not like, oh, we're going to figure out something for so and so to do later. I've told you that. I'm going to keep telling you that. There is significance about your life. Maybe in high school you weren't a standout athlete or cheerleader or singer or artist or whatever. You weren't a standout and you never felt significant. Let me just go ahead and tell you, none of that means jack squat. Now, if you're gifted by God, you may be equipped in certain areas and gifted, uh, and that may be for a kingdom purpose, Right? Like, I, I was good in athletics. There was no kingdom purpose behind that. Yeah. Right? So your gifting doesn't necessarily mean, oh, you're supposed to do that. Yeah. Right? We're led by the Spirit, not our gifts. Yeah. Now, you may discover, wow, I, I didn't even realize I was good in this area. Or there may be an area of your life where you've known that you've excelled, and then God finds a way, or has a way, rather, uh, to use that in the form of ministry. And it may be like, wow, I never knew that he could use this gifting or this ability that I have in the ministry. Well, he's God, and he's got a specific plan for your life, and he's got special things on the inside of you, just like that kernel of corn. It's got some crazy little baby corn stalks inside there. There's things in there. Literally, there's things in there that are important. Think about the life of Jesus. That's easy. Okay, let's start there. Was his life not significant? His life was so significant. Well, it's easy for us to say, oh, well, of course the life of Jesus is significant. Really? 
Well, that's the son of God, and we're his sons and daughters. Do you think he, like, made us, like, bootleg kids? You know, like, well, they're like a clone, you know. We just kind of, no, we're his children. Born of the Spirit, made brand new, created with significance. So we're said, if anyone wishes, uh, he said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. That's your ambitions, your plan, what you made up in your mind to do. Now, that's not a, um, that shouldn't be an intimidating thing to you. It should just mean that's like, you know, I could probably come up with, uh, me being your, your, your age, I could probably come up with a few ideas of what I could do with my life. And from the world's standpoint, there's nothing wrong with that. But as believers, we know that we are to follow the Lord Jesus in his example, right? He said, uh, Jesus said, I've completed down to the last detail the work that was assigned to me. So if there's work assigned to your life, what are you doing, right? You're not going to find this from your, from your best friend or your current boss. You're going to find this in time in the Word, spending time praying in the Holy Spirit, talking to your godly leaders who can give you wise counsel. Doesn't, we never tell anybody what to do, but we can help them in the journey, right? And so Matthew chapter 20, then a couple chapters later in verse 25 through 28, Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That means he said, God, here am I, send me, take me, use me, do whatever you can with me. Here am I, like I'm a vessel, I'm available. See, being available to God, that's the first step. You just make yourself available and, and, and from a place of sincerity and honesty, and guess what? Uh, leaders start coming in your life. Certain words start coming in your life. You start seeing certain scriptures jumping out off the page. God begins to do what only he can do. To begin to utilize your life in the way that you've offered it to him. He will not take your life. He's not going to be like, all right, I'm using you. I need you. No, we offer up our lives to him. The Bible talks about us being vessels of honor. Meat for the master's use. Right? I want to be something that God can use. Well, that's on me. It's on you if you're going to be usable by him. John chapter 13, verse uh, 13 through 16. I'm going to go through a few of these scriptures pretty quickly. It says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did. Truly, truly, I say unto you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is the one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. I love the humility that we see in Jesus. He's like, listen, I ain't nothing without my Father God. He tells me what to do. He tells me what to say. He's empowered me. He's equipped me. That's why when we're singing or worshiping, I love to say, even you guys know, we pray to God in the name of Jesus, right? We find that in the scripture, and that's how we're supposed to pray. Some people praying to Jesus is like, let's pray to God in the name of Jesus, right? Well, sometimes when I'm, when I'm uh, praising and I'm worshiping, I, I like to go to the Father, and I say, Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to make a way for me, to cleanse me of my sin, to be broken so I could be whole, Right? And, and, and then sometimes I'll say, Jesus, thank you for, for being obedient. Thank you for laying down your life. Jesus, thank you for saying, not my will, but yours be done. Yeah. And Father, thank you for the Holy Spirit who teaches me, who helps me, who leads me, who guides me, who comforts me. Right? So the more you know the word, the easier it is to praise God, to, to be thankful to Jesus for what he's done. Does that make sense? They're the Holy Trinity. They're all working together. They're on the same page. So it says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, you guys are familiar with this. Uh, Paul said, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Uh, another translation of the Passion says it this way. I want you to pattern your lives after me just as I've patterned mine after Christ. 
right? What is a pattern? What is a pattern? You, ever, you guys ever seen somebody use a pattern for sewing? They just lay out the pattern and they just like, I don't know, they just draw dashed lines or something. And then it makes it easy, right? We've got those that have gone before us, Pastors Dean and Kathy, uh, Kenneth E. Hagen, uh, Brother and Sister Copeland. All of these have gone before us. And what have they done? They, they've laid down their lives. Even, uh, you know, a lot of times I use uh, men and women of God who are called to the fivefold ministry. But just think about godly men and women, men and women in business, Who's like, you know what, I, I, I've, I've honored God in my finances and God has used me as a king. I mean, I could name people, but I'm not going to name people for the sake of not naming people. Right? People in this, you know, that, that literally they, they have uh, committed their life to the Lord. They've committed, they've dedicated their families to the Lord. Their families are healthy. All of their needs are met. Their life is good. They got a lot going on. They got this going on. They got that going on. They're attending church. They're giving towards the homeschool co-op. Right? Their life is good. Pattern your life after those who have done the same thing that the Word is telling you to do. Does that make sense? So Paul said it, uh, pattern your lives after me just as I've patterned mine after Christ. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about how Jesus did not come to be served. All of us, we, we like to be served. Let's just be honest. Right? But we're talking about laying down our life, laying down our ambitions, laying, laying all those things down. That's what Jesus did. That's what we're called to do. Some people won't do that. Heck no, I'm going to here and I'm doing this. Okay, well, good luck. And maybe they'll succeed. Maybe through hard work, maybe through just some natural wisdom, maybe through talking to the right people. They may have some success, but there will come a day if they are a believer that they will stand before the Lord and give an account for their life, give an account for the things that they were called to do. I don't know about you, but that day is real to me. And I want to help young people who have a love for God. I was thinking about this today. Like, how did I get where I am? It's like, it wasn't because I'm, it wasn't because I'm smart. I know, obviously, it was by God's grace. But God's grace isn't enough. <gasps> it's not enough. That's right. Why? Because we are free moral agents. We have a will. Somewhere along the way, I humbled myself at least enough to say, God, I, I need your help in this decision. God, I need your help in this situation. God, I need your wisdom here. That's not because I'm called to the fivefold ministry. It's because I'm a child of God. That's the exact same thing you guys have to do. Not everybody's willing to humble themselves and say, God, I need your help here. I need some direction. Even when they get that direction, not everybody's willing to obey. See, but when God has your heart and, and your trust is fully in him, then, then you step out in faith, even though your mind is like, no, don't do it. Right? Your flesh is like, eh, this could not work. You say, you know what? I know this still small voice. I'm following after peace. And the Lord will never let you down. Amen? Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. You guys are familiar with it, but let's read it. It says, be imitators of God in everything you do. For then you will represent your father as his beloved sons and daughters. And continue to walk, surrendered to the extravagant love of Christ. For he surrendered his life as a sacrifice for us. His great love for us was pleasing to God like an aroma of adoration, a sweet healing fragrance. Just think about your life being pleasing to God. For him just looking down and be like, they're doing it. They're doing it. They, they've walked away from the world. Come on, somebody. They've put away foolish things. I love that the Word says that. When I was a child, I pooped my pants. But now that I'm a man, I don't. <laughs> I said that the other day. They're, they're the little six or eight years, they were loving it. When I became a man, I put away childish things. I don't eat baby food anymore. If you're going to be a man or a woman of God, you're going to have to put some things away. Let's just say it like it is. Sloppy grace is not for me. God's grace is not my license to do whatever the heck I want and feed my flesh and hang out with my fleshly, flaky, funky friends. No. God's grace has empowered me to walk free from sin. I didn't say I'm perfect, but I am in process. And bless God, I, I promise you, His grace is sufficient. I'm not anointed as a minister to not Google certain terms. I'm not anointed as a minister to not look up certain things on YouTube. I do it because of my love for God. As a choice. 
I choose to honor him. I choose to fear him. I hide his word in my heart that I might not sin against him. That's what we're called to do. If we're doing the same thing the world's doing, what is the appeal for them to come and be a part of our family? You're broke like I'm broke. You're bound like I'm bound. You watch the same things I watch. You listen to the same music I listen to. But if our life is filled with peace and joy and fear has no grip on us and we have strength and we have confidence and we have boldness, don't you think there's going to be an appeal to those who don't? See, this is, a, this is a great invitation. This is like a good deal. We get to live it, and then we get to present it to all the world. So we're called to be imitators. Colossians 3.13 says, Tolerate the weakness of those in the family of faith, forgiving one another in the same way. This is, this is a part of maturity. Right? You're gracious with others who maybe aren't as mature as you. I don't want to sound not gracious. Sometimes when I preach, I get excited. See, we're called to be gracious, right? But if we're going to mature, then we're going to have to put some things away. We do that. Nobody's putting stuff away from me. Nobody's putting bad things to type into the browser away from me. I'm putting those things away. So if we're going to be mature, we're going to have to start doing some of these things. It says, it's talking about tolerating those in the family of faith, forgiving one another in the same way you've been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. If you find fault with someone, release this same gift of forgiveness to them. That is a sign of maturity. Right? Somebody makes a mistake. Somebody's, you know, being a whiner, moaner, complainer. Just forgive them. Just, man, just pray for them. Do something spiritual. If they, do you, if they do you dirty, forgive them. That's why I said, like, when I see these things in the Scripture, it's like, it's a tall order. I want to get better at just, boom, being quick to forgive. I find no fault in them. Amen? I'm thankful for my forgiveness. I want to be quick to forgive others. This is so good. First Peter 2, 20, and, uh, 20 through 22. Let me just read through a few of these Scriptures uh, just for sake of time because I did an I, I, I extra long offering message. <laughs> First Peter 2, 20 through 22. For what merit is it to endure mistreating for wrongdoing? Yet if you are mistreated when you do what is right and you faithfully endure it, this is commendable before God. In fact, you were called to live this way because Christ also suffered in your place, leaving us an example to follow. He never sinned and he never spoke deceitfully. Listen to that. Listen to that first verse. What merit is it to endure uh, mistreating for wrongdoing, yet if you are mistreated when you do what is right, right? Like if you do something wrong and your boss corrects you, you're like, man, I kind of had it coming. I totally crashed the thing. You know what I mean? I got a friend and he like tried to hook up the light tower, but it wasn't hooked up right, you know, and it, or it wasn't that. It was like a, a man lift or something. And he had to call his boss and say, yo, boss, man, I like didn't hook it up right. And then like crashed into the back of my truck, right? So if you get corrected for that and you take it like a champ, good for you. What about if you do what's right? What about if you did nothing wrong and you're mistreated? Can you take it then? Or do you plead your case? I didn't do it. It wasn't my fault. The Bible says maturity takes it like a champ, right? So maybe you're mistreated by a, a friend, a leader, a friend, uh, you know, uh, uh, a mom, a dad. Maybe you've been mistreated. Maturity says, you know what? I'm not going to hold that against them. I'm not going to hold that to their charge. I don't enjoy being mistreated. Right? There's some of you, and, and obviously there's um, two sides to every coin. If you're being physically abused, that's not okay, ever, period. Tell somebody, get help, we'll fix it. Verbally abused, not okay. Right? But as you grow and mature, if you're in a safe place, and somebody does you wrong or does you dirty or says something that's not nice, and you, you forgive them, and you, you don't let, like, water off a duck's back. We go to the zoo, and they got the little glass thing, and you can see these ducks, and it's like the water underneath, it can't even get inside their feathers. You know, like water off a duck's back, right? Because some of the ducks are over by, like, the waterfall, and the water's just going. But I'm like, even underneath, the water can't get in there. Charity, look at that. Did you see that? It's like this little air cushion just around their little belly. See, that's the way we should be. When we mature, it's like, you know what? People should say, man, nothing, nothing shakes them. Yeah. Nothing rocks their boat. Yeah. They're always good. Yeah. They're always confident. They're always joyful. Yeah. Right? And I'm not perfect at this, but this is the goal. We have to know what the bullseye is. Yeah. Okay? So it says here, um, 
Do we need to finish the one? Do we have time for that? Let's jump to, oh, man, this is powerful. Okay, hold on. Oh, this is so good. Let's not skip it. First John 2, 1 through 6. We can't skip the scripture. There's just so many scriptures. I mean, we, could, we just have script. Like, I got like six pages of notes. I'm like, okay, let me trim it down to four. Okay, trim it down to three. All right? We only have so much time. Here we go. I'm not, hey, I'm not John George, guys. <laughs> hey, he's so awesome. Man, he's so awesome. He helped us with some stuff the other day. Me and Charity were talking to him on three-way conference call. He's just so wise. Hey, when there's smoke, there's fire. This person's surrounded by smoke right now. <laughs> okay, John. Okay, man, let's do it. Here we go. First John 2, 1 through 6. You are my dear children. I write these things to you so that you won't sin. But if anyone does sin, we continually have a forgiving Redeemer who is face to face with the Father. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus is our atoning sacrifice. He makes everything good. Now listen, this is not a license to go do whatever you want. But the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. We all need his atoning sacrifice. And what I love is that it's available to the whole world. Meaning it's like we have this. Have you ever been excited to give somebody? Like, you're like, this is a good gift. I'm excited to give it. Anybody? We have a good gift. We should be excited to give it. Amen? It says uh, in verse 3, here's how we can be sure that we've truly come to know God. If we keep his commandments, if someone claims I've come to know God by experience and yet doesn't keep God's commands, he is a phony and the truth finds no place in him. Verse five, but the Lord God will be perfected within the one who obeys God's word. So there's a part on our, there's something to do on our part where we're obedient to the word, which shows that we have relationship with God. It shows we have intimacy with God. There should be fruit in our life. John George, this is another situation. Hey, the, the label on the outside does not match the fruit, right? It says banana on the outside, but it's round and it's orange. <laughs> if we claim to be Christians, we should be Christ-like. Good. The label should match the fruit. Christian, look at the fruit of my life. Christian. Right? This is not too much to ask, but if we just go to fun church, oh, wasn't pastor's message so uplifting? And we go home and we act the same, and we don't walk in love, and we don't forgive, and we don't actually have peace, and don't actually have joy, and don't actually walk by faith, then we have what's called religion. And religion is powerless. It's godless. It's empty. It's void. Right? You can't just know the scriptures and not know the Lord. Right? You can't just know where they are and not live it. Does that make sense? And then it goes on to say, we can be sure that we've truly come to live in intimacy with God, not just by saying, I am intimate with God, but by walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Walking in the footsteps of Jesus. (laughs) You know that one poem about like, if there's only... If there's only one set of footprints on the beach, it's because Jesus was carrying me. <laughs> there's some churchy stuff out there. I don't know if that's a thing, but I think it's a thing. It's a thing. Just carry me, Jesus. <laughs> He's like, just read your Bible. <laughs> just pray in the Spirit. <laughs> Actually sow a seed. You might even get a harvest. <laughs> carry me, Jesus. Right? We have to take ownership. We want... We want to be like Leonardo DiCaprio and that one goes just flowery bed to be just, the ship is just pushing us through and I can see all the stars and me and Charity and Pepper, you know. <laughs> Somebody photoshopped that, <laughs> me and Charity's face on Leonardo DiCaprio and whoever the chick was. They do? Throw it up. Yeah, throw it up if you got it. But anyway, sometimes Christians, we want to just float through life like, Jesus, carry me. And he will, but you're still going to have to do something. His atoning sacrifice is still there to carry you, but you're going to have to confess your sins. Then God is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you of all your unrighteousness. Right? So there is a sense that Jesus is doing all the heavy lifting, but not in the sense that it's like we're in a hammock, you know, just carrying through life. You know, it's not like that. 1 John 3, 15 through 16, it says this. Everyone who keeps hating a fellow believer is a murderer. Uh Uh-oh. 
Snap. Hating a fellow believer is a murder. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. That's hardcore, y'all. If we're Christians, there should not be hate in our heart. Verse 16, this is how we discovered love's reality. Jesus sacrificed his life for us. Because of this great love, we should be willing to lay down our lives for one another. So we're talking about Jesus this month and little cute, Eight pound, four ounce baby Jesus in the major is awesome. But when we start looking at his life, how he laid down his life, how he was so serious about his purpose and his calling, how he literally forgave people, now it's like, wow, that's, that's kind of, he set the bar kind of high. But we should be excited about that because we've been equipped to live this way. Because of the great love, we should be willing to lay down our lives for each other. Um, Ma- Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. For even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone and to give his life in exchange for the salvation of many. Jesus served. We should serve. Jesus gave. We should give. Right? We should be the kind of person who's like, you know what? My flesh doesn't want to get my butt off the couch and go help so-and-so move. But I'm going to get my butt off the couch and go help so-and-so move because love gives. I'll give of my time. You know what? Let me pay for the gas to go to Lubbock. Love gives. If we're going to be like Jesus, we must serve people. We must give. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Even the Son of Man did not come expecting to be served by everyone, but to serve everyone. Uh, This is the passion. It says, and give his life as the ransom price in exchange for the salvation of many. Listen to this. Silence. See what I did there? Just kidding. Listen to this. He gave his life a ransom price for many. We don't have to do what Jesus did. We can do what he did. He did it as a sinless man. He was the only qualified atoning sacrifice. But the same way he gave his life for many, we can give our life for many in the sense that we're sharing the good news with people. If you're too scared to tell somebody, hey, God loves you, You might want to ask yourself why. It's called the fear of man. And God will deliver you from the fear of man. We should be willing to share the good news. We should be willing to share the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus is about the simplest thing you could ever, you know, it's not like you don't have to know how many angels there were and where the shepherds came in the story. But you don't have to know all that. I mean, it's cool, and it's good to know, and it's fun, and I'm sure there's a lot of detail and really important information and probably new revelation that we'll get later when we kind of get some of the basic stuff, right? Sometimes people look for weird, you know, I think the thing with the star was, it's like, bro, go to work on time. Freaking do your job. You're the worst shelf stalker in the whole building. Everyone's stalking shelves, and you're just talking about the star. You're not even Christian. There's nothing godly about you. God is getting zero glory from your life. Our manager hates you. He literally, we all talk about you behind your back because you're so bad at your job. So don't be a weird Christian and look for some obscure revelation. Just do the do's. Okay? Gosh, weird Christians, I just, I love them. See how the love just, I love them. I forgive them. I forgive them. I was probably a stupid Christian one time too, so I forgive them. All right, uh, let's see here. Let me give you just a couple more verses. We're going to be done. You know, oh, gosh, wow. Yeah, hey, 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 how late did Pastor Dean go when I was out of town for Thanksgiving? 11? Okay, I'm going to be done before 11 for sure. All right, let me just, let's just finish up uh, here. This is John uh, chapter 3. You guys are familiar with John 3.16, you know? Anybody who's ever watched a football game has at least seen John 3.16 underneath somebody's eyes. Right, or some guy at the end zone, like holding a John 3.16 sign. But listen, listen to this in the Passion, starting in verse 14. Just as Moses in the desert lifted up the brass replica of a snake on a pole for all the people to see, they were to look at it and, and to be healed. So the Son of Man is ready to be lifted up, so that those who truly believe in him will not perish, but be given eternal life. Verse 16, for this is how much God loved the world. He gave his one and only, his unique son, as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never 
perish, but experience everlasting life. Then verse 17, God did not send his son into the world to judge and to condemn the world, but to be its savior and rescue it. Verse 18, so now there is no longer any condemnation to those who believe in him, but, but the unbeliever already lives under condemnation because they do not believe in the name of God. And so, uh, of God's beloved son. So verse 19, and here's the basis for their judgment. The light of God has now come into the world, but the hearts of people love their darkness more than light because they want the darkness to conceal their evil. So the wicked hate the light and they try to hide from it for their lives are fully exposed in the light. But those who love the truth will come out into the light and welcome its exposure for the light will reveal their fruitful works uh, were produced by God. See, we should hunger for light. God, show me me. Show me that pride that the enemy is just waiting to use to just jack me up. Show me that insecurity that's been holding me back. See, when you come into the light, we should have nothing to hide. We should only be looking for that which God wants to prune away. And so, John chapter 17, verse 4, we referenced it earlier. Jesus said, I've glorified you on earth by faithfully doing everything you told me to do. Faithfully doing everything you told me to do. I, I'm just asking you one thing. What is God telling you to do? This may come, maybe you're like, I don't know. He ain't told me nothing. I need his help, though. Maybe that's you. I mean, we all need his help, obviously, but maybe you feel that way, like I hadn't heard from him in a long time. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and tell you it's not his fault, right? Steal away with him. Play a worship song. Like go, go sit in your car or anywhere where you can go privately and just begin to talk to him, begin to fellowship with him. You know, fellowship, it sounds like a weird Christianese word, but to fellowship is to just talk back and forth, right? So maybe talk to God. Maybe say, God, you know, uh, I, I'm frustrated with my own activity. I know it's not right. I call sin, sin, Lord, I judge you. You know, you receive your forgiveness and say, God, just show me. I know that this is my fault. I know it's on me, but I need your help. I need you to show me a, an adjustment, a change, something I can do to make a correction. And there is power in that simple act of humility. And then maybe just do something radical and just be quiet and just allow him to speak to your heart. Because he will. Now the thing is, is, and we talk about all the time, like when you lift weights, what do you get on your hands? Calluses, right? It, it, it builds up a calluses. You're literally your hand's way of protecting itself from that wear and tear, right? But if you've allowed calluses on your heart, it may take a little bit of time, a little bit of pressing in before some of that hardness of heart wears away. And now all of a sudden you begin to say, hey, that is the voice. I do recognize that voice, right? If you've gone far from God, it's not that he's gone far from you. It's just like, you know, just like when I was a young idiot. I don't know why Omaha Door and Window hired me when I was in high school, right? But they gave me a company vehicle and they wanted me to drive out to Red Cloud, Nebraska and replace windows in a, like a four-story straight out of pit of hell school because we had to carry those windows to like, I think it was three stories. We had to carry those windows out of, every time the semi would come, more windows. I'm like, I hate my life. We would carry those heavy windows up the stairs. But I was supposed to be going to Red Cloud, Nebraska, which means you got to go west on the interstate, and then you got to turn and go south. Well, me, being a dumb kid, man, I'm just jamming the radio, you know, just some bangers on the radio, and I just kept driving, like, way out to the middle of Nebraska. And then my boss called me, hey, where are you guys? Because I had this other guy who had, like, a few DWIs, so he had to roll with me, and he would, like, smoke, but with the windows up, so it was real bad. <laughs> he's like, and I'm, like, coughing because the windows are up. And he's like, looks at me, he's like, that's why I smoke. I got the filter. You don't. <laughs> Come on, bro. Come on, man. Just roll down your window. Okay, so we're just driving west. And my boss is like, where are you guys? It's like I got the high school kid, and then I got the DWI guy. And neither of, them, <laughs> neither of them are here. We're trying to get the job done. Well, I hadn't missed my turn, man. I was just jamming my tunes. I was in high school. You know what I'm saying? When I realized, huh, missed the turn, we had to turn around. Matter of fact, on the interstate, you can't just turn around. You got to wait for an exit. That's right. And so then I was like hauling butt. Literally, we overheated that truck. But anyway, I'm hauling butt. Because I had gone a long ways out of the way, 
it, it took me some time to get there. My boss wanted to know, you know, you guys left Omaha. You should have been here by noon, but now it's in the afternoon. You know what I'm saying? And we got tools and supplies and all that stuff. It cost me time. It did not bring favor with me and my boss. Right? You may have gone out of the way a little ways. It may take you some time to get back, but I promise you it's worth it. I promise you there's no other option. There's like, I'm just going to keep going west till I hit California. Don't do it. You'll be miserable. You'll hate your life. You'll have no joy. You'll have no peace. Just say, you know what? I'm going to make a U-turn. Repentance. To make an adjustment. It's worth it. It may be a small adjustment. I'm not saying all y'all sinners smoking dope and doing all the, you know. I'm not saying everybody's just, just living straight out of the pit of hell and don't give a crap. And if that's you, you need to change. But when we look at the life of Jesus and we see how he gave and he served and he was just perfect, we should say, I want to make corrections to my life where it become more and more and more and more like Jesus. Amen. Amen.